Okay. All right, welcome everyone. We'll call the meeting to order for Wednesday, September the 1st. Disclosure of pecuniary interest. If anyone has any, please bring it forward to the clerk. Uh, at roll call, uh, Councillor Moyer will be here a little bit late. He is coming, but he's going to be running late tonight. Minutes from the previous meeting, minutes for August 11th. Um, it includes the planning, quarter revision. Need a motion to accept the minutes, or is there any business arising? Any errors or omissions, business arising? Seeing none, moved by Councillor McClinchy, seconded by Councillor Hemming. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, we need a motion to go into committee of adjustment. Councillor Keogh, Councillor Nickel, all in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, six o'clock, our first item on committee of adjustment is a proposed lot addition for driveway access proposed to be merged with 152 Catherine Street. The owners are Mike and Joan Batram. And I believe we were expecting them to be here. Go ahead. I read. Yes, go ahead. Okay. The purpose of the following public hearing committee of adjustment is to give the committee and or council as well as the general public an opportunity to hear all interested persons with respect to applications before the committee council this evening. The public is advised that comments expressed in written material presented are a matter of public re record for available for full disclosure. If a person or public body files an appeal of a decision made this evening to the Ontario Land Tribunal without having made a written submission to the committee and or council, the tribunal may dismiss the appeal. If you wish to be notified of any decisions on applications being heard this evening, please submit a written request to the clerk's office. Any decision made on applications this evening to either approve or deny an application will include a mandatory 20 day appeal period, which will be outlined in the notice of decision if requested. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Once again, this is for the consider the application for B08 2021 located at 148 Catherine Street in Park Hill. I'm not seeing Joan or Mike here yet. So, uh, they won't be here this evening? Okay, thank you. Stephanie, if you'd like to begin. Yes, thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen with you. There we go. So the purpose and effect of the application is to sever a 183.4 square meter or approximately 1,974 square foot parcel of land for lot, addi lot addition purposes, comprising of the northerly part of 148 Catherine Street to be merged with the abutting lots to the north, known municipally as 152 Catherine Street. The lands proposed to be severed and conveyed are vacant of any buildings and structures, being comprised of an existing driveway that serves the abutting parcel to the north, uh, which is be which they are being added to. And no change of use for this proposed parcel uh, is being proposed as part of the application. The lands proposed to be enlarged, so 152 Catherine Street, are occupied by an existing commercial building used for the storage and sales of recreational vehicles, automobiles, and motorcycles, operated under the business name of Four Seasons Performance Inc. The lands to be retained contain a single detached dwelling on full municipal services, an accessory building, and has an existing access off of Catherine Street uh, for both the dwelling and um, I think the detached structure as well. And as Council may recall, um, a previous severance was granted in 2015 for the purposes of establishing an easement over 148 Catherine Street, where the aforementioned driveway is situated, and the easement had the effect of providing a right of way in perpetuity to allow the owners of 152 Catherine Street to have unrestricted access to the driveway. And this easement now represents the lands um, which are proposed to be conveyed and added to 152 on Catherine Street. 
Staff are of the opinion that the proposed lot addition can be considered a minor adjustment and will result in no adverse impacts on neighboring residential properties. There will be no physical changes in appearance to the lands as a result of the lot addition. And the applicants have indicated, again, no um, proposed change of use at this time. The notice of the application has been circulated in a requirements of the in accordance to the requirements of the Planning Act and staff received the following comments. Hydro One has no comments or concerns at this time. The North Middlesex Chief Building Official has no objections to the proposal. Bell Canada has no concerns with the application. And Asabo Bayfield Conservation Authority has advised that the property does not fall within the regulation limit and as such no concern with the proposed lot realignment. At the time of writing the subject report, no comments or concerns have been received from the public. So it is recommended that the application be granted subject to conditions which council will have before them. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. At this time, I wanna introduce Ray and Janice uh, Crowder. And I'm sorry I missed you earlier, but these were sitting there. Uh, do you have any remarks you'd like to add to this? No, pretty, pretty straightforward. Okay, thank you. We have no written submissions, you had said, and there's no public comments on this. Uh, committee questions from the committee. No questions from the committee. We do have a recommendation to grant this application. Moved by Councilor McClinchy, seconded by Councilor Keo. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. guys. We're a couple of minutes early here yet. Yeah. All right, we need to adjourn Committee of Adjustment and, and convene as a public meeting. Deputy Mayor Knellison, Councilor Hemming, all in favor, carried. Uh, we do have to wait till 6.10. Are the applicants, they're coming in now? If the applicants are here, we'll, we'll go forward. I come, come right up to the table. Yep. Come join us. This is a public meeting to uh, consider application ZBA 15 2021, located at 30 William Street, East William Street, pardon me, an amended zoning requirement of the employment exemption M2 1, the zone to facilitate a building addition. And uh, welcome. Everyone. And Stephanie, if you'd like to begin, please. Thank you. All right. So the purpose and effect of the application is to amend the zoning requirements of the employment exception M2-1 zone in order to facilitate a 200.7 square meter or 2,160 square foot building addition located on the front and side of an existing industrial woodworking or cabinet manufacturing business. Um, the applicants have advised that the proposed expansion is being requested in order to accommodate additional storage and office space, as well as employee washrooms. And no additional employees are being proposed at this time. Um, you can see on the map on your TV screens in the council chambers, or perhaps on your computer screen if you're joining us online, um, the proposed addition is in, outlined in gray. And the surrounding uses are predominantly residential and institutional in nature, with the East William Memorial Public School located abutting the subject lands to the east, and the Nairn Optimist Park located to the south of the property. Staff are of the opinion that the billing addition is in conformity with the provincial policy statement and the county official plan as industrial and employment uses are encouraged within settlement areas with full municipal services. 
The North Middlesex official plan recognizes that there may be existing uses that do not conform to the land designation of the plan and permit the continuance of them so long as they were legally established. Although the subject lands are designated residential area, the workshop and woodworking slash cabinet manufactory, uh, sorry, manufacturing are legally permitted within the zoning bylaw through the site specific um, employment zone. Staff therefore are the opinion that the expansion of the existing use does not generally offend the policies of the official plan. Although the subject lands are located in a residentially designated area and surrounded by predominantly residential and institutional uses, an industrial use has been in existence on the subject lands uh, since the 1970s and staff are not aware of any land use compatibility conflicts with the former or the existing industrial uses. Staff did express concerns in regards to the reduction of driveway space and or parking as a result of the addition being located closer to the road. The applicants, however, advise that it is a family run business and it currently consists of six employees two of which intend to reside on the dwelling on site and park in the residential driveway to the left, two who work online who would not require any parking spaces, and then two additional employees on site whose vehicles would be able to be accommodated in the modified driveway at the front of the workshop. The products that are manufactured on site are delivered to clients using personal vehicles in the form of a cargo van and truck and trailer, and no customers attend on site. So it is staff's opinion that the amount of parking is adequate for the scale of the business operation and that the building expansion will not result in increased traffic. Based on the approximate size of the existing driveway after the building expansion, as well as the employee information that has been provided, staff do recommend that a minimum of three parking spaces be required for the industrial use and have included um, that recommendation in the draft bylaw. And generally staff will continue to work with the applicants on the delineation of parking spots through the site plan process and it is also noted that parking for business purposes on the road shall be strongly discouraged. Um, in order to ensure proper and orderly development, staff recommend that a holding provision be placed on the subject lands, which will require the completion of a site plan control process, um, including registration of the agreement on title prior to the removal of the holding provision. The notice was circulated in accordance to the requirements of the Planning Act and staff received the following comments. The North Middlesex Chief Building Official stated that no objections to the proposal, however, recommends that site plan approval be required for this proposal. And additionally, the owner should be advised that limiting the distance of 2.4 meters from the side property line may limit the amount of openings in the adjacent wall. And at the time of writing the subject report, uh, staff did not receive any comments or concerns from the public. So it is recommended that the application be granted. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, would someone, the applicants, have anything you'd like to add? Any comments you'd like to add to this? Um, I, with regards to the door was no openings on the side. I don't think there was any intention to have that. There's, there's one, at, there are two at the front. And there's one at the back. So I think that's what we're keeping it yeah, at. Yeah, nothing on the side at all. Nothing is right for that. Okay. Yeah. Other okay. than that. <laughs> all right. No, thank you. Uh, we have no written or public comments on this one. Uh, council, questions from council? No questions from council? We have a recommendation to approve this. Councilor McClinchy, Councilor Keogh. All in favor? Carried. Actually, it's a nice addition. It's nice to see a, a home business going. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> so I will be providing you with a notice of decision in the next um, few days, and then that will outline your appeal period. And then after that, you can proceed with the site plan process. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. You too. Our, our next. Uh, 
our next uh, portion is for 620, I believe. We're a little bit early. I think I'm content if the electronic delegate that the participants are here. Are okay, I'm, I'm all right with that as long as we have everyone. We have everyone here. Okay, all right. We have nobody registered to uh, public to speak at this. Okay, all right, thank you. So this will be a uh, development proposal for 250 lots in Elsa Cray. Access is proposed from the extension of Hamilton, Atkinson and Mary Street. The owner is Gallard Developments Incorporated in care of Mike Radcliffe and the agent is Dillon's Consulting Limited in care of uh, Melanie Muir. Now I believe we have Zoe coming to this and I believe that's all that's coming and Mike as well and Mr. Radcliffe as well. All right, so whenever uh, we're ready to start, it would be Stephanie, you're going to begin on this? Yes, thank you. All right, so the, the purpose of this report uh, this evening is to provide council and the public with preliminary information on an application for a plan of subdivision and a zoning bylaw amendment application um, for lands within Elsa Craig. And a recommendation will be given to council at a later meeting after feedback from the public and the agencies and ministry circulation has been received and taken into consideration. The purpose and effect of the draft plan of subdivision is to create 250 lots for single detached dwellings, um, which are highlighted on yellow in the screen in front of you. Two medium density blocks for future development purposes, which are highlighted in pink on the screen in front of you. Um, and two blocks for future road connections, which are in yellow uh, to the north, if you can see my cursor here and here. Uh, one block for a parquet, which is highlighted in green here. One block for stormwater management, which is this block down here. One block for an access easement for a pathway um, to existing residential um, areas for connectivity purposes for the park and five new public roads and as mentioned the access is proposed from the extension of Hamilton, Atkinson and Mary Streets and the applicants have also submitted concurrently a zoning bylaw amendment application to rezone the subject lands um, as shown on the draft plan in front of you so lots one to 250 from the future development zone to the residential density one exception holding zone. And again, that's to, in order to facilitate 250 single detached dwellings with a minimum lot area of 400 square meters, a minimum lot frontage of 12 meters, a maximum lot coverage of 55% and a maximum gross floor area as a percent of lot area for the single detached dwellings of 50%. And the removal of the holding provision would be contingent upon the completion of a subdivision agreement. Blocks one, sorry, 251 and 252, again, those are the medium density blocks shown on pink, is being proposed to be rezoned from the future uh, development zone to the residential density two exception holding zone in order to facilitate two medium density blocks for future development of townhomes with a minimum lot area of 180 square meters, an interior side yard setback of 1.2 meters, and a maximum lot coverage of 55% and removal of the holding provision for those two blocks would be contingent on both the completion of a subdivision agreement and a site plan control agreement. And additionally, uh, block 256, which is the parquet shown on green, is being proposed to be rezoned from the future development zone to the parks and recreation zone in order to facilitate the park block. I also noted for this plan is that the portion, the north portion of the subject lands contain an existing plan of subdivision, which was draft plan approved by the Ministry of Municipal Affairs in 1991. 
Um, the 1991 plan has not moved forward with the development and no longer meets development standards or practices. Uh, the new proposed plan of subdivision has been submitted as a new proposed plan that encompasses the former draft plan and additional lands to the south and, in, and is intended to replace the former draft plan approved plan. The subject lands are designated residential within the North Middlesex official plan and contain mineral and aggregate resources overlay as per schedule C of the North Middlesex official plan. And the subject lands are currently zoned as future development uh, within the North Middlesex official, uh, sorry, zoning bylaw. The provincial policy statement, the county official plan and the North Middlesex official plan all encourage and have policy direction for residential development to be located within settlement areas on full municipal services. Additionally, there is policy direction to encourage a variety of housing types to be able to accommodate uh, current and future demographic needs. And um, as well, there is policies for developments should take into consideration um, the character of surrounding uses and built form as part of the um, development proposal. The notice of the applications has been circulated in accordance to the requirements of the Planning Act and staff did receive what are considered to be um, typical agency comments or standard ones that we receive for this application type from Hydro One, uh, Bell Canada, Enbridge Gas, County Emergency Services, as well as the North uh, Middlesex Chief Building Official had no objections to the proposal. Um, it is noted that additional agency comments are anticipated um, prior to a recommendation being given. In addition to the agency comments, staff did receive um, one written submission prior to the report being finalized. Uh, from so Stephanie's freezing up. I wonder if she shuts her video off, if if that would help. Try Stephanie, to can you circle back? Uh, I turned off your video, so we're going to try again. We lost you at the first uh, public uh, public record received. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Better? Okay. So at the time of writing the report, we did receive one public comment from Joan O'Neill at 206 William Street. Um, and I am going to read it uh, verbatim. So I am opposed to the proposed townhouses next to senior citizen apartment at Craigwell Gardens. I think condos for retired or semi-retired individuals would be a much better fit for the vulnerable sector living next to that particular section of proposed development. I would hope both the mayor and councillors of Elsa Craig would appreciate my concern considering they have both worked in the long-term care sector with the elderly. Other than senior apartments at Elsa Craig, at Craig Will, there is currently no other options for retirees looking to downsize in Elsa Craig. Additionally, who is going to be responsible for the infrastructure costs related to this development? I don't think taxpayers should be responsible for infrastructure costs related to this proposed development. All costs related to this proposed development should be absorbed and recovered by the owner. So I would note in addition, um, three additional public comments have been received subsequent to the report being finalized, which we will address in the written submissions portion. And finally, it is also noted in ways of public consultation, Dylan Consulting held a public open house via Zoom on July 27th, 2021. Fewer than five members of the public attended the meeting and questions and concerns raised in included but not limited to uh, construction and phasing of the development, what types of dwellings are to be expected, single story versus multi-story, multi and the ownership of the units, um, rental versus freehold in regards to the townhouses. 
So in summary, a more detailed planning analysis as well as a recommendation will be provided at a subsequent council meeting after comments received from the public and agency and ministry circulation have been taken into consideration. So it is recommended that a subject report be received for information purposes. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, so we have all our written submissions and everybody's had the opportunity to see. At this time, uh, I would ask the applicant if you have anything you'd like to add at this time. Comments? Uh, the only comment I'd make on that last, um, I guess, request from Joan. Uh, so we have taken that into account before we even heard from her. And they are senior oriented one floor condos we're going to be building that back into Craigwell Gardens. So we plan on having uh, the senior demographic uh, abutting to Craigwell Gardens. Whether it's rental or ownership, we're not sure, but that is definitely what we are planning to build there in the townhouse section. It's one floor senior uh, condominiums, essentially. Okay, thank you, Mike. You're welcome. If, any other comments from the applicant at this time? Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Stephanie. I, Mike, do you mind? Do you have another comment? You can nope, go ahead. I'm, I'm good. You go ahead. Great. Thanks. So my name is Zoe. I'm here on behalf of Dylan Consulting and on behalf of Melanie Muir, who's unable to attend tonight. So thank you, uh, Stephanie, and thank you, Mike, for your comments and detail and attention to this application. Greatly appreciate it and all the comments that have been received to date. Uh, so we just wanted to speak to that. This is a site for development, given that it's within the urban boundary. It's intended for uh, growth and the revitalization in the area continues and this is uh, intended to be part of that. Um, the mix of housing that's offered in this, uh, as Stephanie mentioned, includes the single detach and the townhouse blocks. It's a higher quality townhouse um, and development product that's seen in Lucan as well. Um, that's done by the same developer. A number of background studies, including a traffic impact study, a functional servicing report, a preliminary stormwater management report and planning report um, have all been completed to date to analyze the site and its use compatibility in the area. Um, and we're happy to answer any questions that uh, might be brought up tonight. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Zoe. Uh, questions from Council? Who'd like to start? Council McClinchy. Oh, okay. With this uh, plan of subdivision, I see there's different lot sizes. We go from 12.3 to 12.9, uh, 13.9, 9. they're all different sizes then? What's the total, what's the total frontage of all these? Through your worship, um, Stephanie, would you be able to speak to the residential uh, limitations for frontage? So through the mayor to the councillors, um, through the rezoning application, the applicants have applied for a minimum lot frontage of 12 meters, um, but there is no maximum. So in regards to the variety of lot configuration, I would defer that question if, if the applicants have any um, additional thoughts on the, the differentiating lot sizes. I'd be happy to speak to that if you'd like. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, so yeah, as per our subdivision in Lucan, we have 40 foot and 50 foot lots and they range obviously in between. So that's what we're gonna do. We're planning to do here as well. So the smallest lot is a 40 foot. And in Lucan, we've done probably a hundred houses on the 40 foot product and they've turned out really well. Okay. Um, and then we also have the 50 foot product, which we offer in Lucan as well. A um, little bit more expensive. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the plan. Um, the ones in between obviously will just, you know, if it's 45 foot lot, we'll just be able to do something in between. So that's the plan. Okay. Uh, just, so what's a, what's a side yard to each home? How many feet between? So I believe the side yard would, would be the same, no matter if it was a 40 foot or a 50 foot. I think it's, I believe it's one meter on one side, one and a half meters on the other side. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Other questions from council? No other questions from council? I, I would just uh, make a comment to the, uh, the medium density. Uh, Mike, you've already spoke to it, that uh, we want to clarify to people that what the intent is here with those ones behind the, the apartments that are existing. And I think you hit it right on the head, what, what the purpose is and what the need is. And uh, I have to say that I've received 
quite a bit of feedback, people wanting to downsize in their existing homes, stay in the community and, and be able to uh, downsize and, and stay within Elks Craig. I think this will meet the, what people are looking for. That, that's the purpose of those, of those townhouses or those medium density. Other questions from council? No other questions at this time? Gee, you did a good job, I guess, Stephanie. Uh, but Stephanie, you're going to add that we have two more written submissions, I believe, that you're going to speak to. Yes, I can do that right now for you. Okay, please. So the first one is from Jim Hodgins, um, who's a resident at 169 Queen Street in Elsa Craig. And again, I'm going to read verbatim. Um, I have a vent that goes outside my house from my stove and my bathroom every spring. I have to go outside and clean the black suit off my outside walls. That gives you an idea how much pollution gets inside my house from all the traffic that goes by my house. So the reason I am writing is because it doesn't take a very smart person to know that when this subdivision goes in, traffic will be three times as bad. So I am writing to ask if there has been any discussion about at least diverting the truck traffic around town. This has been discussed in the past and I was told that they don't want to take traffic away um, from the downtown. Well, I have lived here for a lot of years and I basically don't see any truck stopping in the middle of downtown. I am very concerned about the health implications for my wife and myself, so would really like to see something done. That is the first written submission. Would you would you like me to um, proceed to the second one? Yes, go right ahead. Then we can oh. speak to that. Perfect. So um, the second one I have is from Ken Oach. My apologies if I mispronounced that. I think this is great for our village in North Middlesex as a whole. This has been talked about for 30 plus years since we have lived here. It will be exciting for us to watch it grow basically from our backyard. There are a few concerns, however, hopefully they would or will be addressed at the meeting. The first concern is that any infrastructure upgrades and or costs would be the developer's dime and not us on ratepayers. And also um, the developer would be responsible for the going rate of lot charges. These expenses may not show up now, but again, they do at some point. I don't think that this should be at us ratepayers' expense. One last question, is that townhouse block such a good idea that close to the nursing home? We all know that those places can attract that close to a senior's home. I don't think I would be comfortable having my aging parent that close to something like that. Maybe others on the planning board should ask themselves that question. And we did receive one um, more. So we do have a third written submission. It is from Amy Walby, the property owner at 11774 Petty Street. Um, and they had a question in regards to, well, I will read it again, word for word. There is a small creek at the southern end of the subject lands that runs west under Queen Street um, slash Petty Street into the woods on the west side of the street and ultimately drains into the Asable River. Please tell me how the plan will address protecting this waterway, which flows over my property during construction and after with permanent residences erected on or near it. Any proposed plan of subdivision must address and protect this waterway. And that concludes our written submissions received to date. All right, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, in regards, let's go to the first one. And the biggest question was, has there been discussion on rerouting truck traffic as a result of this uh, development? And uh, Jonathan, if you'd like to speak to that. Um, through your worship, uh, or Zoe, I don't want to speak on your behalf or Mike, so please chime in if I uh, misquote you, but I think that is the intention of the traffic impact study uh, that will be assessed through the engineering design stages as we progress ahead. Um, the ultimate improvements that may be uh, incorporated would have to be something that would be uh, judged by the county and uh, local municipal staff as well, but it is going to be addressed through the traffic impact study. 
Okay. So that at a later state. Yes, it, it rather volume. It's a quantity of volume and tr and sizes sometimes, but volume takes the the pillar in this discussion. Okay, and also the question was uh, on who's paying what and paying the develop you know paying the proper appropriate development charges. I believe that is correct. And, and three ownership again. Uh, that is the premise of development charges. And as this council is aware, and some of the general uh, general public, we are doing a, uh, a review of our development charges right now. Uh, so that will be coming forward as well. And uh, any developer would be subject to the going rate at that time and consultation periods through that as well to engage us. All right, thank you. And the other one, uh, I believe we've addressed uh, from the same concern as Joan uh, O'Neill's letter. And that was about the townhouses. And Mike has already spoke to that, I think, as well. Unless, so questions from council after these letters or hearing this? Any other questions? No other questions from council? All right. Thank you very much, Stephanie. And thanks, Zoe and Mike. Okay, so we have a recommended motion in front of us. You making that motion? Moved by Councillor Nickel. Seconder. Deputy Mayor Cornelison. All in favor? Carry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike, Zoe, and Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Okay, so this time we have to adjourn our public meeting and return to the uh, meeting. Need a motion to go to our regular meeting. Councillor Hemming, Councillor McClinchy, all in favor? Carry. Thank you. Uh, is it 640? 636, but we have, do we have uh, Ben is here? Okay, so we have, and Crispin's here. All right, so come on up. Uh, it is a delegation of 640 for the Middlesex Federation of Agriculture Community Services Study, and the representatives are Ian Bremner, Marcel Myers, they're here in person. Ben LaFort is here on electronic, as well as Crispin Colvin is joining us as well. Oh, jo and Joanne, I'm sorry, Joanne. Joanne Full is here as well. Sorry, Joanne. Who's... Uh, yes, if you can social distance, we, we, when we're sitting here too, we take ours off as long as we're social distance. Uh, so who would like to start? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Rop. I just will uh, introduce Ben as uh, one of the researchers and who is our, our guru when it comes to finance, you might say. And he's going to make the presentation on the cost of community services. And we hope that your council will be able to take part in that uh, study with us. So uh, on that note, Ben, I'll turn it over to you. <clears throat> Great. Thanks, Crispin. Um, okay, let's see if I can share my screen here. Okay, I don't have, I'm wondering if I'm able to share my screen or I believe we also sent in a PowerPoint if that's easier if you have it on, on your guys' end. Through your worship, Ben, uh, I actually enabled that already, so you should be okay to uh, share a screen. Oh, I should, okay. It's saying the host has disabled participant screen sharing. My apology. I'll uh, do that right now. Oh, sure. We're all in training on these new hybrid meetings as we go. It's learning as we go. So I don't think so. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Twice as much time to get half as much done as we <laughs> Sometimes. Anyways, uh, I'm, Marcel and I are part of the Middlesex Federation of Agriculture Executive. And there's been a process started in the United States, driven by a lot of agriculture, how to determine how much services are charged towards agriculture according to what they actually use for the tax base. And, you know, we divide up roads and stuff and, and whether each group's paying their fair share. Now, most studies have shown that usually residential are the, are the benefit or from it. And the, as you're well aware, we've been pushing for a lower tax rate. And this is, Part of the reason maybe to explain it, but why we deserve it. But when we got into the process, I started thinking agriculture the last few years is the one that's taken the real hit. But in the next go around, it's going to be residential takes the real hit. And at that point, it might be useful for council. They will say, well, you haven't really been paying quite your fair share. They may not see it that way, but it'll give you one more thing that's, you know, when your house goes up 50% in value your taxes are going up and you're going to hear about that. So that's sort of where I think it's a benefit for both of us. Now it's 
geared the studies for rural, small urban municipalities. One that's mostly Strathroy care doc probably wouldn't be that relevant. For uh, Adelaide Metcalf, on the other hand, is basically a rule, again, not quite so relevant, where council or North Middlesex is a, a blend of rural and urban. And we think it's probably the, one of the best ones to, if you're interested, to possibly study. So, so why don't we hear Ben's presentation? We can speak further after the yeah. presentation. Okay, perfect. We'll, we'll hear from Ben and then we can do our questions uh, right. following. Perfect. Thank you. Go ahead, Ben. Great. Thank you. All right. Is that up on the screen for you guys, the, the uh, slides? Yes. Great. Okay. So, yeah, uh, just kind of reiterating some, some of what was just said there. I'll, I'll kind of give the, the uh, more uh, detailed version overview here. So, uh, what the study proposal is, is a cost of community services study which I think was just mentioned is very popular in the US, um, was uh, first developed by the American Farmland Trust in the 80s. Um, and since then they've done several hundred of these studies across different um, uh, rural municipalities in the United States. Uh, and basically what uh, the primary objective is, is to break a municipality's land base into these distinct categories and allocate all the municipal revenues and all the municipal services expenditures to each of those land use categories. So for, you know, broad strokes would be residential, commercial, industrial, farm, and, and sometimes forest properties are merged in there as well. Um, so you have those four land use categories. Um, and, and basically the idea is uh, that this will provide a kind of a snapshot in time because we're looking at, these are case studies, right? So it's one municipality in one year. So we're looking at in that municipality in that year, how the revenues and expenditures were broken out by those distinct uh, categories. Um, four general steps is to how we've done the studies in the past, how they're completed is number one is defining those land use categories, which is rather simple because we use the uh, property tax classifications, right? And that's all neatly uh, provided in the financial information returns. Uh, then it, the steps two and three are really that, uh, what the study is all about, which is collecting that data on local revenues and expenditures, uh, looking at all year end reports, uh, budgets, et cetera, uh, where money was spent, why, um, <clears throat> and then making that allocation to for each of those items that we collected uh, to each of those land use categories defined in, in step one. Um, and that's done through, you know, analyzing the data, speaking with uh, staff, with department heads, and, and getting their input on kind of what drove, you know, which project, and, and kind of once it's all tallied together, um, putting it into a nice little, you know, digestible number, uh, which is kind of expressed in a ratio of, of expenses over, rate, over revenues. And to kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about, this is the average results for uh, 151 studies that were done in the U.S. Um, and basically the way to interpret this is that horizontal red line right there, that's basically your break-even point. And this is the results of the U.S. studies. So what that is, a red line is showing that at, at that point, uh, at a ratio of one would indicate for every dollar of revenue um, that a, a land use category brings into the municipality. Uh, they're also demanding exactly $1 in revenue. So $1 and $1 uh, break even point. Below that red line would be um, saying that um, in that year, in that municipality, the land use categories below the red line with a ratio below one would be bringing in more revenue than consumed worth of services and above the red line, the opposite, where more is consumed than brought in on a dollar for dollar basis. So that's kind of the, the results in, in it, like the, the, how they're summarized in a way that's kind of digestible. Um, we have done a few of these studies uh, in Ontario. So as I mentioned, it's quite uh, you know, um, commonplace in the US, not so much in Canada. Um, so we've done two studies in Ontario, one in 2014 we did in BAM in Elkin County. And last year we completed a second study in Mulmer in uh, Dufferin County. Um, so we had two objectives for the Malmer study. First was to basically verify that you know, begin to, uh, you know, collect Ontario specific data, because if I go back to this slide for a second here, 
you know, we have these average results from the U.S. studies, uh, but it's not exactly like we can just kind of import those results and say that's what life is like in, in Ontario um, for a number of reasons. One, again, there's snapshots in time, these results, right? So they're not necessarily forward looking. Uh, they're looking at one particular year. And as well, um, Ontario, uh, the United States has a very different uh, municipal financial structure than, than we do in Canada and we do in Ontario. In terms of the services provided, the revenue tools available, it's, it's quite different uh, from the U.S. To, to Ontario. So, again, that's another big reason why we need, uh, we're interested in Ontario-specific data to, to see if that kind of trend holds. And also... The big other step too, because this is another item that OFA has been extremely uh, interested in for a long time, is looking at the current structure we have for municipal finance, for lack of a better term. You know, the revenue tools we give municipalities, the services we ask them to deliver, um, is that sustainable for our smaller rural municipalities? What change is, might we be able to find, um, mostly at the provincial level, that, that could make uh, life easier financially in, in our small rural municipalities because uh, that, that is extremely important. It's where our members live. Uh, so the results of the, uh, I'll quickly roll through these uh, in the interest of time. This is kind of how we did the MOMER study. Again, we defined those land use categories, residential, business, and, and farm forest. Uh, so we collected all the data. I, I've given this presentation a few times, actually say like the last in-person meeting I ever had was... Uh, to collect the data for this project in, in Malmer before uh, lockdowns last March. Um, so we collected all that data, met with the staff there, um, you know, using the financial information return, like I mentioned, to break down. Basically, we took different pieces. This is the, the tax piece. And then we kind of broke it down into these three categories that we had uh, again. And we do the same thing. This is, you know, you know, this is very small, but it's just showing. Uh, a snapshot of the expenditures uh, of the operating expenses in Mulmer in, in, for uh, 2018. Uh, just to show again that we broke all those down after this is the end of results into, you know, those three land use categories, residential, uh, commercial, and uh, firm. Um, so again, then we, uh, the, the heart of the project is making those allocations. How do we allocate all the, the revenue and all the expenses to each of those three land use categories? Uh, some of it were, you know, what, what we try to use is, is uh, using demand as a proxy for, for the cost of services. So, for example, um, uh, looking at the, the data for uh, responses for fire services, uh, these weren't the actual numbers, but just as a, a way to kind of conceptually understand, say there were 100 calls for service in that year, and say 85 of them went to residential classes, five went to farm properties, and 10 went to commercial or industrial properties. That proportional demand then uh, guides our allocation for that line item on, on the budget. Uh, so then it would be 85% residential, 5% farm, and 10% to the, to the business class. Uh, so that's an example of how we made some of the allocations. Others, we leaned on uh, the expertise of staff, and, and some of it was more clear cut. Um, these were the final results, which uh, for the Mulmer study, which uh, not not too out of line with what we see in the U.S., although uh, with the exception of the commercial, which I'll get to in a moment, which is quite a surprise. Um, basically, what this showed was uh, for residential in that year, for every dollar of revenue, uh, the residential property class brought in, it consumed 92 cents for the services. Farm property, 61 cents consumed for every dollar brought in. And surprisingly, what we found in the commercial class was in that year, $1.34 services consumed per dollar brought into the municipality, which is quite surprising because most, almost every study that we've done and we've seen other studies done, commercial is the lowest ratio uh, due to the high rate of taxation. So um, I guess the caveats here was that Momer had an extremely small commercial industrial class. Uh, so it's very sensitive to any out of the ordinary expense, right? It doesn't take... If, if, mom, if the commercial class is very, very small and maybe something out of the ordinary happened that year, it, it can kind of sway the results, which is a perfect example as, as to why I always couch these as a snapshot in time. It's one municipality, one year. I wouldn't take this result and say, oh, you know, commercial industrial properties are net negative fiscally because that's just not the reality that we all know it to be. Um, so those were the results we had in Malmer. We also wanted to quickly, uh, I'll run through this quick, um, and this is a piece that I, that I think will be interesting on the municipal side, 
is looking at uh, you know, alignment of, of services and revenue here. Um, again, we only give municipalities one property, one uh, taxation tool that they really control, property tax, and may not ex necessarily be the best revenue tool for all of the services that we, at, we, I say we, you know, Ontario society are asking municipalities to deliver. Um, so uh, there are several items um, that we identify in the, in the second half of the report. A lot of them are, are well known around this table, I'm sure. The reduction in the Municipal Partnership Fund, which I am sure has had negative impacts uh, on North Middlesex, as well as many other uh, rural lords here municipalities. Um, uh, looking at what we also found in um, the uh, Molmer study too, was looking at um, different services that are, are kind of beneficial to um, perhaps more folks that, that live even in the municipalities or kind of a public good, uh, but are being funded through largely property tax in um, the municipal border, right? So some examples, and that are also quite large on, on the, um, um, the budget. Uh, the two items that we kind of that stuck out significantly were education, uh, and municipalities still play a role in collecting educational property taxes, but, but don't play a meaningful role in setting policy. Uh, around education at, um, uh, provincially, um, as well as uh, policing services was another big one that we saw in Mulmer um, that um, uh, was a significant line item. There was reductions. There used to be a you know, piece in the municipal partnership fund that would help offset some policing costs has been reduced over the years. Uh, just looking in the second half of the report at identifying areas of perhaps OFA municipalities can, can work together to go to the province to say, uh, we need more additional funding either through municipal partnership fund or uploading of education uh, taxes completely to the provincial level. If we're not giving municipalities a you know, say in setting the policy that maybe the province should, should cover the whole bill and allow that property tax revenue that you're collecting from education to go towards say roads or bridges or what other um, uh, items need to be paid for within the municipality. So, um, that's a long kind of in short of it in a, uh, uh, of the study is we have the two pieces we're looking at, yeah, what, uh, what services and revenues are being demanded by different land use categories within uh, the municipality and what areas just more generally um, are, are we uh, maybe putting our uh, rural municipalities in a bit of a financial bind by the current setup of things. And is there areas we can identify and go to the province together on? So uh, that's the, the objectives. What would be required from a municipal commitment if uh, North, Middlesex, North Middlesex were interested in hosting a study? Uh, essentially, um, the only cost really to North Middlesex would be time, time of uh, SAP, because we would need to be, you know, getting the data and follow up emails or Zoom calls, et cetera, with different um, staff potentially of, you know, trying to understand the data for that year. Um, but in the uh, you know corporate world we live in, a lot of it can be done electronically. You know, I can zoom into this meeting quite easily. Um, we were able to do the entire uh, study in Mulmer electronically after that those initial meetings, and, and it worked quite well. So um, that that kind of is just the what would be required if North Middlesex were were interested. Um, so you know, I we covered a lot of items there in a, in a really quick period of time. So why don't I just open it up for any questions or comments or discussion that you folks might have. So thank you for the time. Thank you, Ben. Um, is there anything that anyone would like to add from on the report, like Ian or Marcel or Crispin, Joanne, anything you want to add before I turn it to council? Uh, I don't think so. No? Okay. Uh, so questions from council, comments, questions from council. Let's start. Deputy Mayor Canals. First of all, I just want to make a comment. I found it very difficult to follow the presentations. It, I think the sound was uh, it, it was challenging to hear, yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. So uh, I'm not sure. I'm oh, sure. your microphone, Adrian. Your microphone. Sorry. So I'm not sure if our understory isn't clearly. However, it, I did read through the report several times and I found it a very interesting report. There was a great deal of uh, information in there. One thing that came to my mind, and, and I would like to ask some clarity on that, and that is specifically the roads. And, and as you know, as being the former deputy mayor, our roads are our single largest expense 
in North Middlesex, you know, that is tax-based funded, right? And the majority of those roads are rural, correct? You know, and, and as, with that being the largest expense now, I, I did note that I think I believe he said that farm homes would be included in the residential, like in the urban areas. I'm not sure how that makes any sense. And I'd like uh, to have sure. a better understanding of that. Okay, can let Ben answer that. I believe he's ready to answer that. Sure. Okay. Sorry, I didn't know the audio was not great. Can you hear me okay now? Yes. We, we okay. A little bit. It's got a bit of echo to it, but we can hear you. Very cool. Okay. Um, so the, uh, so I mentioned you probably, maybe it also probably couldn't hear when I uh, go around to the slides as well, how we determine the different uh, land use categories. So the residential firm uh, commercial is using the property tax codes. So an on-farm residence is still in the residential property tax class. Uh, so that is, is how it's included in the residential class. Uh, just because it's located on a farm, as long as there's people living in it and a family or farmer living in it, it's in the residential property tax class and, and included with the other residents. Okay, so, Adrian. So yeah, go ahead, Marcel. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, simply said, every farm that has a residence, the residential component of that farm is residential. And we pay a separate tax for that house than we do for the rest of the property. And so just like a house in town, we're on that single house on the farm, we're no different than a house in town. The, the difference being, of course, that there are several more homes in a kilometer in town than there is in a rural area. And therefore, the cost of a kilometer in a rural community, in a rural area, is significantly higher than per, per, per home, per residence, than it would be in an urban area, correct? Right. Thank you. Yeah. And okay. if I could just add... It's, yes. There's going to be a lot of judgment calls in this because, well, recreation, that's a pretty simple one. That's a person oriented service, but fire, roads, policing, there's a whole bunch of them. We're dividing between different classes. It's going to be a bit of a challenge, but I think it'll, if you go at it fairly, I think you'll be able to come up with a, Jonathan will be able to come up with a reasonable split between them. Yeah. Go ahead, Jonathan. Okay. Okay. Just one uh, final comment. I would okay, I, I would agree with your with your recommendation that the municipal uh, the interior municipal partnership fund needs to be revisited, and I do support that. Councillor Keel. Thank you. Um, with the information that um, you would like to receive, is this not already available through impact assessment that you could easily collect that and marry up with uh, with that organization? Sure. So it'd be a uh, bit more accurate at, at, at current value. Yeah. Ben, so ben. On, on the taxation side, certainly a lot of that information is available, right? If we were to look at, say, uh, the 2019 uh, fiscal year, uh, your financial information return is likely already filed there. That would that's a public document, and that would contain a great deal of of information. Where so where the the need for you know other information would come in is that we're moving far beyond just the assessment and taxation we're into also looking at you know the grants that you receive right the ompf allocation the you know capital grants as well as expenditures right on on that's the other half of the project is you know where was that money then spent what you know what roads were worked on uh, you know how many planning applications were there building permit fees and looking at the whole picture and some of that may be publicly available some of it may not and uh being able to have that kind of access to to the experts in the municipality to say to get clarity on certain items uh, when necessary so some of it certainly is publicly available but we're looking at the whole picture in a, in a project like this Okay, thank you. Other questions from council? Um, okay, I, I have a couple of questions or a couple of comments I'd like to, do you wanna go ahead, Councillor Hemming. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, in, the, in the presentation, you made a few comments in regards to looking for government funding. And I, this is more of a comment than anything else, but uh, to, to get them to pay their share of the, of the funding, but every year they keep decreasing their funds. Our UMP, our UMP fund is literally in, in a few years, probably won't, will be non-existent. So 
that's a that's a challenge within itself that we all have to deal with. So yep. it's yep. just it's common. I don't want to be frustrated. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Most unfair down property tax rebate because yes. they used to pay yep. farmers and seventy-five percent. Yep. They're still doing that. And North Middlesex would be in super shape. We we wouldn't be sitting here with the same conversation, correct? Exactly. So you. is there other comments from council? Mm -hmm. I have a I have a couple. Uh, one is okay. I'll start with the fire. I'm struggling how you will dissect that because so much of the, what will you do with fire calls where it's accidents, you know, on our county roads where it's nothing to do with, uh, with our residents. It might be somebody from outside the community. Would they just not be used as part of the, but something has to be used there because there's a total cost of fire. I'm just wondering how you break that down. Sure. So what would be the driver there is if it's a vehicle response is what type of vehicle are we looking at? It's, it's how we do the roads as well, right? Is it a passenger vehicle? Is it a fire machinery? Is it a, uh, you know, a, a truck bringing in supplies into the city for commercial businesses? So what would be the driver there is, it, uh, sorry, no, no pun intended on the driver. The, what would be uh, pushing the allocations would be uh, at that at certain calls that were made to vehicle responses, what type of vehicles were involved? Are they residential, farm, or, or business? Okay, thank you. I, Marcel. If I can, yes. I, I appreciate Ben's comments, Your Worship, but through you to add, if I'm not mistaken already, if you have uh, county or highway calls, you bill the accident, do you not? Does the fire department not bill for some of the expenses? So for that some. would offset it. Yes. And on top of that, if they're local residents, you don't bill those local residents. Well, as Ben said, if they're farmers, okay, if they're residential homeowners, I think accidents, if you break it out, is a little bit, bit easier than at first thought. And you're right, training and equipment are going to be shared. Okay. All right. I just thought that's going to be, uh, that's going to be the judgment. I, I gather that's one of those things you have to do a judgment on. Uh, another one that pertains to North Middlesex, we touched on a little bit when we talked and, and that is our water because of our water lines and all the, our rural and our, and our urban pretty much has water almost throughout the whole municipality. And I think that would have to be included into our, our cost sharing and where we spend our money. And it's just a comment to that. I mean, is that, would that be the purpose to, would you include water? That's what I'm asking. Yeah, if, if it's on your budget, you're on the operating budget, we would uh, we would aim to include it, yeah. Okay. Uh, another one I have is staff time. I guess I'm, I'm kind of wondering how much staff time are we talking approximately? Yeah, um, it, that's it's a good question. And so basically, it, I'll kind of just lay out all the uh, cards on that too. Is So what happened in uh, Mapleton as well, if, if it is easier, I know what we did, they did in Mapleton is basically they build the local federation for the cost recovery of staff time. Um, if that makes things uh, easier to, to, you know, more to contemplate whether or not you want to participate. Uh, I would estimate uh, if, if call, if most things could be done electronically, email, uh, Zoom calls, perhaps. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't think it'd be more than perhaps 10 to 15 hours total of, of staff time when you consider the different, uh, uh, folks within different departments we need to speak to. Uh, we're getting a little bit more efficient at, at this, by this point, this will be a third one. So uh, that's where I would peg it at uh, approximately. Okay, that's less than what I was expecting. So, okay, thank you. And I guess my last question to this is the purpose. What is the ultimate purpose when you get this information? Like what's the purpose of it? What What is, what's gonna happen with it? Sure. So. Uh, Two things, right? So we have the two objectives. One is um, getting more data on what is the, uh, essentially what, when we did the second study in Malmer, we had a lot of interest from our county federations to continue doing these. So OFA has made a commitment to continue to do more of these studies on an ongoing basis for one, so that we can, yeah, collect that data on the Ontario specific data, looking at different land use categories um, over time in different municipalities, eventually, if there are patterns that emerge, we may be able to be make more conclusive results about uh, the fiscal impact of different land uses. We're obviously most interested in the farm property class. Um, and then the second piece as well, again, as we get more of these studies done and we collect more data on the municipal side, what are the policy items that uh, 
makes sense for rural municipalities and OFA to, to work on together. Again, we've all identified the partnership fund, but um, is there is there other items that are they're basically causing undue financial strain on on lower uh, small municipalities? That's mostly what we're interested in too. Is our lower tier rural municipalities. Um, eventually, we may look at doing some of these studies at the county level, but um, particularly, you know, a, a lot of the changes that have been done um, at the fiscal arrangements between the province and municipalities have not necessarily been at the benefit of, of our small lower tier rural, rural municipalities. And uh, that is the second piece of interest is, is how can we uh, go to the province for uh, lobbying on policy that can uh, help our lower tier municipalities be more fiscally uh, sustainable and, and uh, I guess, give some breathing room, essentially. Okay, thank you. I think that pretty much uh, goes in line with Crispin when he comes to the county as well with your messages to working together how we're going to work with the Ontario government, you know, to make it more sustainable for us. So, okay, is there anything you just want to add to that as well? I, so yes, other questions? You. Oh, go ahead, Ian. Your time let us make a presentation. We look forward to your decision. Okay, thanks, Ian. Thanks, Marcel. Thanks, Ben and Joanne and Crispin as well. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Guys. Thanks. Uh, this time we have department reports. So I have a uh, question here on this. So we've heard this presentation. Are we going to come back with a, a report on this so we can discuss this further? Uh, because I don't want to just leave it hanging. Where are we going to go? Uh, through your worship, I would uh, suggest that you, you leave it to Estelle and myself to reach out to uh, their team and kind of match what the, the proposal will be. Now hearing that it's only going to be 10 to 15, even 20 hours, I think what they're really looking for is access to the information right. and interpretation of the information. Uh, how we got to that. So uh, we can bring a report back to council to kind of set the, the landscape of where we're going and some timelines, uh, but this is gonna be con completely driven by uh, uh, OFMA. So um, yeah, we'll leave it to them to kind of drive here. Councilor Keogh, and, and then Deputy Mayor. Thanks Mayor. Uh, Jonathan, I guess what I, did, what I would like to know, and I didn't really wanna ask them, but just what is the cost North Middlesex for this? just for this, which I consider to be loose information. From all indications that I have received, it's just time uh, in deciphering the information. So, so I did catch the 50, 10 to 15 to 20 hours, but no one wanted to commit. Is that a month or is that annually? I <laughs> believe it's a one time. He uh, said in total. He did say in in total? Okay. that was in total. Okay. Well, I, At least that's what I... I found the sound, but I found it to be kind of tinny and I was trying yeah, to it was hear excellent. everything. I think Ben's room was much larger than, uh, yeah. than than what we could see and there was an echo going on in there. So maybe if uh, we listen to it on the back feed, it might be a little easier for us to uh, follow. Okay. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I'd be interested in knowing how many municipalities are going to participate in this process. You know, I know they're, they're, they've come here to lobby us, but how, how many other municipalities have they lobbied? How many others are actually considering it? Uh, through your worship, I can certainly ask them through that as we refine that. It always starts with someone. Um, Mableton did uh, go first. Uh, and in discussions with them previously, when they first engaged the mayor and myself, uh, if they would like to pick one municipality from uh, Middlesex County. And uh, as Ian had suggested, it was the best candidates are us or Southwest, uh, mainly because we have that large rural and then a couple urban clusters that complement it well. Uh, so it really, there's only two in selection in Middlesex County. And I don't think, I mean, I like the idea of the transparency of it and really finding out where we spend our dollars. I, I, I mean, I do like that part as long as that's why I asked the purpose, you know, and that's why I'm just wondering the purpose. Yeah, if I may, uh, through your worship, yeah. I think this would actually complement the background studies that we have to date from the BMA report, the five-year audit, our annual budgeting, and it would just be another feather in the cap as it would be to demonstrate where the value driven from taxation is going. Um, it, and yes, it is lopsided. I will be the first one to say that. And it changes, it fluctuates every four years based off impact alone. Uh, so I think it would be really valuable to some of uh, our rural, our rural uh, residents to know what their value added for their uh, dollar gets them as it would be. So we'll wait for to hear back from the report, all right? 
All right, I think that's leaving it. That's what I wanted to know where we're gonna tie this in. So, uh, department reports. And the person from the drainage superintendent, the O'Neill Drain and O'Neill Drain Branch, Drain, pardon me, tender. Jonathan, go ahead. Mayor, members of council, what you have in front of you is the recommendation for the contractor award for the O'Neill Drain and O'Neill Branch. The recommendation is that council receive this report and direct staff to award the construction of the O'Neill drain and O'Neill branch drain tender to Robinson Farm Drainage Limited for $509,418.69, including HST. Any questions? Questions from council? No questions from council. We have a recommendation. Moved by Councillor Hamming and seconded by Councillor Keel. All in favor? Carry. Thank you. So the next one is a report on the Revington Municipal Drain Tender. Mayor, members of council, what you have in front of you is the review of the Re Revington Municipal Drain Tender. The recommendation is that council receive this report and direct staff to award the construction of the Revington Municipal Drain Tender to Robinson Farm Drainage in the amount of $145,414.05, including HSD. Any questions? Question from council, Deputy Mayor Nelson. Are, are these uh, these uh, projects, are they time restricted or are they uh, flexible and that they can be done at any time? Uh, typically within the tender, we would ask that it be done by, so this one would typically done by next spring. But yeah, there's usually a time restriction on it relative to it. I don't know specifically what these ones are, but right. we restrict it too much, price goes up. No, and, and that's yeah. why I'm asking because if they're awarded to the same contractor, are, are they able to accommodate within the time factor? That's all I'm asking. Yeah, typically, yeah. Robinson has a good history in the municipality delivering on time. And typically, once they're here, they do both. That's what we've seen. Okay. Any other questions on this? If not, we have a recommendation in front of us again. Councillor Moyer, moved by Councillor Moyer, seconded by Councillor Nickel. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, next is a report from the facilities manager and is the Elks Creek Dog Park update. Mayor Ropp and members of council, the report in front of you is an uh, update on the Elsa Craig Dog Park and it is to uh, be re received and filed. Um, it's just a little bit of a background of what's been going on since the last report was brought and to clear it from the uh, deferred items. The Elsa Craig Village Association has expressed interest in continuing to look for ways to improve or sorry, in like to figure out ways of making this happen. And one of the improvements that they suggested to the original report is to come up with a subgroup under the Elsa Craig Village Association, which would be a group dedicated to a dog park itself. Um, we're gonna take the time to explore this, um, try and put together a group and then form a type of agreement which would outline maintenance, um, costs on that side of things. This report also has the uh, results of the survey that was issued. So the survey, we actually got 159 responses. And of those responses, we had 87% of people say that they believe North Middlesex would benefit from an off-leash dog park. Um, and then of those responses, as you can see further along, the biggest concern that they have is due, due to safety. Um, so that is easy to address through bylaw, I believe. Um, Again, that's only 2.4% of our population that responded, but generally surveys do not get much more than that. So at this time, Joan and I, or Councillor Nickel and I, sorry, are planning to meet with the Village Association on a weeknight to just discuss exactly what they are gonna do for fundraising for the park and what a subcommittee of them look like to look after the dog park moving forward. And then at that time, I will bring back another report that outlines exactly whose responsibility will be where, what the funds will be attributed to from the municipality versus the, the fundraised funds, and then move on from there. 
Questions from council comments? Deputy Mayor Canales. I have one. I, I don't know if our treasurer can answer this question or not. Do we still collect a fee for dogs in any way, shape, or form? I know a number of years ago, it was incorporated in our municipal taxes that each resident paid a certain, uh, I think it was $5 per home for, for to remove the, the need for the renew dog tags. Do you know if that still exists? And if, if I, so, could that be, could this project be funded through that? So if I can, we'll direct that to the clerk. So we did implement uh, quite a few years ago the uh, permanent dog tag system, which is quite correctly the $5 to register the dog. Um, so there, there isn't another revenue source for dog uh, expenses at this time. And I think if you recall, it was hard to go door to door to find somebody. It was um, resources to do that. And the permanent tag system was received very well. We still have people come in all the time, new residents coming in wanting to register their dogs. Because again, we want to get the dogs returned to them. Um, and, and we really haven't had the same issues of dogs um, running at large. But it's certainly something if council you know, feels or if staff feels that the need is for that to be reconsidered, staff can certainly do that for council and look at the fees um, associated with the expenses as well. So as of right now, it's only the $5 one-time fee. So I have a follow-up. So those $5 per, per, per property, is that fund established then specifically for dog-related issues or does it go to animal control or where, where do those $5 go? Well, so the original amount that we would have collected uh, would have been probably in the general operations budget. And, uh, Right now, that would be a similar type thing that would happen. Thank you. Other questions? Councillor Nickel. Do you find that registering a dog has dropped off since people are now microchipping their dogs? Have you noticed a, a decrease in registration of dogs? I can't say specifically. Like I said, with new residents moving in or people, because we do quite uh, publicly advertise about getting your dog tag and simply for we can get the dogs back to them. I can't comment whether the microchipping is doing any different. Okay, because I, I took a small survey on my own and I asked six dog owners if they had a license for the dog, five of them did not. And they said, well, they're microchipped. I don't need a license. I know where my dog is if it gets lost, which I found very um, discouraging. Councillor Moyer, and then Councillor McClinch. Uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, the one of the largest concerns was the safety, and you mentioned it could be handled through bylaws. Um, just wondering how how those bylaws could could be enforced, and if it's you know, is, is there any sense in having bylaws that we can enforce? Um, through Mayor Opt to Councillor Moyer, the idea would be to have bylaw check in on the park, make sure that the posted rules are being followed. Um, and I think having a little bit more eyes on it at the start would deter people long-term for it. If you know you're being watched while you're at the park, you're probably more likely to respect the posted rules. Um, typically at other dog parks, the biggest issue has been dogs fighting dogs. And um, that is generally due to the owner's responsibility and it falls under their dog owner liability act. But um, Mo for the most part, I think talking with other managers, dog parks are generally safe, but just having that presence there to reinforce the rules when, when somebody else can't be there is going to be helpful. Okay. Councilor McClinchy, I believe, did you have a question? No. Okay. Any other questions from council? Okay. Right now, it's just a recommendation to receive and file but for them to go forward and uh, Councillor McClinchy. Oh, sorry, Councillor Nickel, sorry. Sorry, John. Move that, and we go for and we go forward with uh, this. All right, seconder, seconded by Councillor McClinchy, since I've already mentioned your name once, right? All in favor? Carried, thank you. It's a good report, uh, Brandon. So now you have one more, I believe, and that's Parks and Recreation Update. So Mayor Ropp and members of council, this report in front of you is just a, I guess, semi-annual update at this point to um, 
keep you guys in the loop of what we've been up to and where we're at with some of our projects. So I just want to touch on a few things that have happened this summer. Obviously, the Park Hill Splash Pad was was our biggest project this year, and it, it was completed on time um, and has been well used since it's been up. Um, currently, we are just finishing up our arena compressor upgrade. That was a capital project that was approved as well. Our To tie into that, our ice plant will be turned on tomorrow and the compressor will be fully operational and we hope to have ice on September 13th. Um, the arena flat roof stage two project is completed. Um, since the project has been completed, there have been a few leaks, which is discouraging, but it does show the, the good relationship we have with Garland Canada. And they, they've been the ones doing our roof management project. So with their expertise in roofing, they went up and they found exactly why it leaked due to poor worksmanship. And they've contacted the company on our behalf and are having them come back out there to fix their error. Um, and then the final project was the diesel lawnmower, which um, we purchased in early spring. And so far it has been very fuel efficient, which we quite anticipated it would be. And the cost difference between our gas lawnmowers and our diesel lawnmower should be made up by the end of the year. Um, we did have a couple unexpected repairs this summer. Our library, Elsa Craig Library's air conditioner gave up this year, so it's been replaced. And our Carnegie Hall um, had some soffit damage from one of the windstorms that we had. That was replaced as well. And then I did want to talk a little bit about my staff and a little bit of an operational change, as you guys, we talked about last week with pickup trucks or last meeting, sorry. Um, our cemeteries and our baseball fields, which used to be our main source of complaints, this year have been crickets from both. So it, my staff being assigned to one thing where they can take sole responsibility in has really paid off this year for us in, in that. Um, and then I did want to touch on some highlights we've had this summer. Um, during COVID, obviously a lot of sports didn't happen. But we had baseball return this year um, and they had great numbers. And this year, our YMCA summer camps had 314 total campers, which is the most they've ever had by a significant margin. They've had successful camps in Elsa Craig and Park Hill this year and up to three core cohorts, cohorts at a time, which in last year during COVID, I think they had two at a time three weeks of the year so it's been great there and then i also wanted to touch on the upcoming fall and winter season um, obviously covid landscape continues to change and we're not really sure what will happen this fall with the new variants starting to pick up what we do know is hockey season is scheduled to start on the 13th minor hockey is taking their full ice load the park hill stars are taking their full ice load the Park Hill Silver Blades are as well. And our men's league is looking like it will probably return. So we will be close to 100% ice um, in terms of our normal year by October 5th. And then I did want to touch on Perfect Mind too, as I had hoped to have it implemented for this hockey season. We've ran into a few issues with our payment provider, which has kind of slowed the process, but we still are hopeful to have it done within the next month and operational. We're just trying to work out some kinks on the back end in terms of payment, and then people should be able to book our ice online. All right. And the recommendation is just to receive and file. Okay. Councilor Moyer. I'm just wondering with the announcement today with the certification of, uh, of double, being double vaccinated, how's that going to affect and, and who, who will monitor that as uh, in and out of the arena? So through Mayor Rob to Councillor Moyer, currently we're not 100% sure on how it will impact us. We're still waiting for the update to the actual regulation itself. Um, what we do believe is that if it's not a youth sport a group, sporting group, that a vaccine passport will be required. How that is going to be monitored is yet to be determined. Um, and that will be something that I'll be working on moving forward and the rest of this week and obviously next week as well, trying to get a system in place that works for not only the user groups, but us as well. 
What I can say is that in the current regulation, if the person responsible for the recreational facility is not there, the permit holder then holds the responsibility. So with regards to active screening and um, contact tracing, that's already pushed on to the permit holders and the OHF and the OMHA are quite aware of that and they actually have in their plan that they will be handling that. So for minor sports, COVID passports or vaccination passports, sorry, would most likely fall to them as they already have somebody at the door monitoring for the other two as well, so. What are the regulations right now on, uh, on having spectators? So currently we are allowed 50% capacity. Um, spectators have to be masked at all times. And that, that's basically the only restriction we have on spectators. Um, we will work with minor hockey. I meet with them on Friday to go through a detailed plan with them. If they so choose to make things easier on themselves in terms of COVID screening and that to limit it to say one person per child. And then if they, that person's responsible for child care and has children that they need to look after, they may be able to bring them in as well. But we, we will work with each group individually to try and figure out what works best for everyone involved. Okay. Thank you. Other questions from council? Councillor Hemming. Thank you, Mayor Rob. Uh, Brandon, you said the Elsie Craig Library uh, air conditioner need re replacing. What was the cost of that? Um, the cost of that was $9,700, I believe. The new air conditioning unit needed new wiring because the old wiring didn't match up with what currently existing and there needed to be a little bit more duct work ran as well. And yeah, that's what the total. And that was all included? Yeah. Okay. Good. Other questions for Brandon? No other questions? All right. Thanks, Brandon. Do we need a motion to receive and file on that? Councilor McClinchy, Deputy Mayor Knellison, all in favor? <laughs> I saw you twitch. <laughs> Thanks, Brandon. Passing of accounts. So the report that you have in front of you outlines the municipality's expenses for the period of August 3rd, sorry, August 6th to the 23rd, 2021. And the staff recommendation is that council receive and approve the accounts for that date in the amount of 1,299,394.55. Any questions? Questions from council? Councilor Hemming. Thank you. Um, there was medical uh, uh, number 003946, medical upgrades. Can we just get a, just filled in on what that was? That was payment made to Dr. Starts with an O. Yes. To your worship, Dr. Yes. Olmstead. Um, so it was uh, seed funding to get his practice up and going. Yeah, I didn't know if it was for, you know, actually whatever machines were. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm looking at you, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> no other questions. We need a motion to pay our bills. Deputy Mayor Knellison, Councillor Hemming, all in favor. Carried. Thanks, Estelle. Uh, committee reports. All right, we'll go through them quick here. Uh, Lake Huron Pipeline. There's a meeting coming up in uh, October. Okay, thank you. ABCA. Our next meeting is September 16th, which I will not be attending due to the warden's tournament. Uh, uh, blue water recycling. Okay, anything you want to add to that at all? No? Okay. Uh, economic development. Nothing there right now. Uh, local school advisory. Okay. Uh, the rec committee. No, wastewater treatment, wastewater, nothing on that. Is that committee's really, is it going, is it? Um, through your worship, a lot of the agenda items have now shifted to something coming towards council. It's come to council uh, now instead of that So it, it, it's like the second billing cycle and uh, the evaluation on what next year's will look like is 
just to save on time and effort for everybody, we thought it was more relevant to bring it to council. Okay, ahead. so we could actually uh, remove that. Remove that. Okay. Uh, policy, we have not met. Uh, fire committee, nothing. Uh, Aqua advisory, nothing at this nothing time. There. Okay, correspondence. Uh, the first one I have is Lampton Shores notice of public meeting for consent located at 9170 Arcona Road. Receive and file. Ministry, was there a comment on that? No, sorry. Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, notification of funding allocation of $200,250 towards water treatment software modernization. Thank you note from student at North Middlesex District High School, year four proficiency award recipient. And last is the County of Middlesex, Mark Brown with the Woodlands Conservation Officer the, and weed inspector, and that is regarding the uh, LDD moth, the uh, gypsy, the European gypsy moth. And I hope everybody's had a chance to read that. That was the that was the report that came to county council. It's it's a good report. It really uh, outlines well what what uh, and the approach. Okay. Uh, through your worship, I've people had indicated and facilities staff have indicated that there is an infestation there. I'm not too sure at the scope or the magnitude of that, um, but it's safe to say that they're within the county, certainly. So, what is county got plan to treat all these areas? So, if, if you look, the county would only do the county forests, but um, Mark Brown is not in favor of spraying. And the reason is that spray, he says, kills, does not differentiate between the gypsy moth and the monarchs and, you know, the other, the good, the good insects, as he said. So he does not recommend it at all, does he? And he's quite clear that on the report on that, that he just said, let nature, he believes, he's a firm believer that when people get involved with mother nature, we screw it up, for lack of a better term. And so he's very much doing the good neighbor policy, as he said, that if the neighbor wants to spray their property. They won't know no problem if they go over the line type of thing, but otherwise to let nature. And there is some recommendations on how to deal with them as well. Councilor Keogh. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I did look through it, but I didn't look through it all. Is that report available or can it be available on our website? In the event that we have any questions, I can just say, if you check the municipal website, there's a good report on there. Can we copy that? Uh, through your worship, it, well, it's available through our agenda right now, but if you, if you want us to bring it ahead and maybe put it under the facilities or a forestry tab or something, we'll find that, an appropriate That would be handy, it. just, um, they could maybe- Even, a, more even under a, can we put it on a gypsy moth, like a, a tab for gypsy moth, they'd go right to it. Or, I would suggest that we actually leave it as a, a bulletin for okay, a, a, a bulletin little while as one of the scrolling okay. ones. And then as right. we get closer to winter, it'll come down. And then possibly, okay. depending on if the infestation continues next year, uh, revisit it and put it back up. Great. Uh, I think it's a great idea. I think it's it's the best information that I've seen other than just the form letters you always got. It makes it an easy referral when you do have a rate figure. You yeah. can just look at it. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on that? No? Thank you. That's our correspondence. We don't need a motion, I don't believe, for that. And so uh, other and urgent business. First, uh, updates on the wastewater treatment plant in Park Hill. Through your worship, members of council, again, uh, this was just an indication from the information that was shared for the delegation for AMO. Um, again, we did take a different tactic this year in terms of trying to delineate the job creation and the taxable benefit for incurring a large capital project like this. Uh, the meeting and uh, uh, through uh, your worship, feel free to, you know, second what has happened, but it was yep. fairly well received uh, insofar that I actually had a follow up meeting with the director of Minister of Infrastructure yesterday. Uh, we didn't get the news or the, they didn't get the suggestion of, uh, you know, where the possible funding could come from. Uh, but they hear us loud and clear. And honestly, for the last three delegations that we've had, I've never been able to get to a director so quickly, so fast. Uh, and he is advising us on other alternative sources of financing. 
Uh, and all I can ask is that they keep North Middlesex uh, at the top of the list and that we'll keep beating that drum that we need this funding. So uh, th this is, again, the information that was provided. We just want to be open and transparent with you and the community that we are working every provincial, every federal avenue to get funding. And I, I just add, it's, it's always good when, when Jonathan called to follow up with him, he knew exactly who he was and exactly what he wanted. And he got it. And even during the delegation, when, they, uh, when the minister, the deputy minister asked him if there was any questions, he said, no, I got it. This is, and he listed what we, what we'd put down. And uh, the, the, the delegation was very good. Like it was a good one brought forward. And so, uh, yeah, it was good to see. At least it's a, we're on the ground floor there, you know, talking to someone that's, I said, that's the best I can say from that. Uh, and any other, anything else you want to add to that? I think that's, um, it's just in front of you. The, the biggest question that I had yesterday for the director was um, the ICIP funding that was just recently announced, the deadline being September 9th next week. Um, the cap, there's limitations. We've talked about it a little bit. It, the cap is $5 million, one project submission, submission, not award per municipality. Um, and I, I asked for his honest opinion, and it was you should be applying for your water mains that meet this threshold. Luckily, we have two projects in the hopper that will match nicely. Um, the contribution from the provincial feds, if approved, is a $5 million cap. Uh, two of our projects are coming in around six. Right now, again, early, early, early estimates uh, subject to the market conditions uh, in the Park Hill Main Street one around $8 million. So we're going to be applying for something for next week, uh, most likely the Elsie Craig water main improvements. Uh, but uh, he did note that we are in a need for these type of stimulus and he encouraged us to apply for that water main after speaking with him for about 45 minutes. Yeah. We don't, we don't want to waste our submission for asking for the moon and losing, getting nothing. So what, yeah. So any, okay. Other business comes for nickel. So um, I would like to have council consider having staff look into the COVID-19 bait vaccination policy uh, that would impact all municipal employees, contractors, consultants, volunteers, students, and counselors, bearing in mind the human rights of those of, of individuals and medical exempt individuals. I'm bringing this up due to the increased number of COVID-19 cases due to the Delta variant and because staff and council interact with the public. I believe we do have an obligation to the public to be safe and to take all necessary precautions to protect our workers as well. Um, so I'm proposing that council would consider this. Okay, Jonathan, would you like to uh, um, start? Through your worship, uh, I, I get, this is uh, the new buzz, I guess, for COVID as it would be is uh, ensuring mandatory vaccination for all staff employees and as per council, or, um, Councillor Nichols' uh, uh, suggestions, volunteers, and the list goes on. Uh, I can share with you that there has been discussions with other local municipalities on a collective approach. Um, and to date, I'm aware of a policy being uh, considered or endorsed at Temp Center uh, with one close in succession for Middlesex Center or it may be in uh, before us. There is barring conditions that we will have to go through with our collective uh, agreement with our unions. Uh, notification to staff, uh, deadlines, but we are looking into that uh, and into discussions with uh, Donna and uh, the mayor. Uh, we're hoping to bring forward something for correspondence next week to at least let you know what the buy-in is from other municipalities, but it may just take us a while to get to that. Uh, and it seems that either the, the due date uh, for some organizations is either the end of October or the, or the end of this year. And we'll try to get it to you as quickly as possible for consideration. But I think jointly, um, this is a policy that needs to be fully endorsed by council and the organization, uh, not something that's just in the organization in the background. So it will be coming forward to council. Okay, comments, questions, or comments on it? Go ahead. So, so this is not a motion that we're going to consider today. It's something we're going to get. We're going to receive information from staff. But we were going to. We're bringing something forward. It's a, a changing landscape. Yes. At the very least, it will be an update um, because we could craft a solution, and the province could uh, come and suddenly just say this is this is a new lay of the land. 
Uh, I hope that's the case because it's a lot of effort on us locally. Uh, and I, I mean, even single tiers, lower tiers and upper tier municipalities to put this much effort into something that would otherwise be provincially mandated, similar to what we had to go through with the, the masks at the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, but much more time consuming. Yeah, and so I, I think, uh, and I know it's, I'm told they're going to be bringing it up at CEO's meeting. It'll be a converse, one of the conversations. That's correct. We're having a meeting next week with legal representation and HR uh, to discuss the ramifications of putting in, in such a policy. Uh, we're not a private institution, so we're a little bit different. Uh, so we have to kind of mind our cues a little bit more as we go through this process, but something will be coming forward to council. Okay. All right. So I, I think, I have yeah, a question. Can you... um, I was approached by a couple of individuals and myself as well. What's happening with the bridge at there and there? Because there's anytime I go through, there's never anybody working there. And that was the same concern with uh, the people that asked me to find out. Okay. So I'll just start and then you can, um, talking with the county engineer, they are waiting for materials for the repair, the last I heard. So they, what they had to do was either close the bridge because that crack was found in it, yeah. but the engineering found that they could run the other side of the bridge. So until it's fixed, it'll stay one lane, but okay. they are waiting for materials. Okay, so uh, I, you, I was wondering. That's what, okay, Jonathan's okay, I was heard the same thing. Everybody, nobody, yeah, and that's everybody. why, uh, but they did have to either close it yeah. or make it. I'm glad it's a single lane. I'm glad yeah, that they were able to do no that. Problem. Like but that's why, and if, yeah. if anybody asked, it's just yeah, waiting okay. for the I gussets, wonder. you know, to be able to fix okay, that up. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, was there anything else on, on the vaccines? I think if we find out what everybody's doing on that, go from there. All right. Any other business? No other business at this time. The deferred items are in front of you here. Uh, communications, including county council. Uh, we haven't had a county council meeting since our last council meeting, so I really don't have anything to report. Uh, the clerk, you have something to bring forward on this, I believe. I had uh, through email provided a sample template for um, the mayor and CAO's consideration. And subsequently I did forward it out to council by email, but not sure you had time to read it. But it's regarding the uh, municipal rec recognition of um, September 30th being the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Um, AMO had provided some resource materials for local municipalities to consider. Um, so I just was looking for council direction if that was something that you would like um, a motion, a draft motion prepared for the next council meeting. As I indicated, there was a template um, provided. So council can certainly have a look at that if there was anything they wanted to add or questions about that template, if they could get back to me by September 8th. Otherwise, I would, if it is council's direction, draft um, something up. I think it is important to recognize it. Um, and this year, we could do it through the motion and even in the motion, have it uh, that orange shirts be worn at a council meeting leading up to that date. It can always be built upon, you know, as, as things evolve. Um, but I just thought it was maybe a, a first start uh, for this council to consider if that is the direction. Uh, we can do. I think we should have an motion on it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Move, moved by Councillor McClinchy, seconded by Councillor Nickel. Is there discussion on it? We can look like a bunch of big pylons sitting here. No discussion on. It. All in favor? Carried. Great. Great. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, reading of the bylaws. The bylaws are listed on the agenda. Bylaw 60 is the Revington Drain. Bylaw 61 is the O'Neill Drain. Bylaw 75 is for the zone, uh, the zoning amendment for 30 East Williams Street, heard earlier through planning. And bylaw 76 is your confirming bylaw. We're looking for first and second reading. Councillor McClinchy, Councillor Hemming, all in favor? Carried. And third and final. Councillor Nickel, Councillor Moyer, all in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we need a motion to go into closed session and uh, also to appoint uh, Donna Van Hui Donk uh, to take the minutes for that section. Motion to go into closed. Councillor Keel. Councillor Nickel, all in favor? Carried. 
and we will take a short break here uh, just before we go. So we'll just have a couple of minutes. So, and just a reminder to the uh, live stream that following the closed session, that the meeting will go back to open meeting and continued with the live stream. If there's any recommendations,